it is our pleasure to to invite uh, Rafael Pestori from MIT to uh, give us a talk on physics enhanced deep surrogates that are trained end to end. Hi, um, I am. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranjan, for the introduction. Uh, so I am a postdoctoral associate uh, in the math uh, mathematics department at MIT, and today I'm presenting about physics enhanced uh, deep surrogate trained end to end using Julia. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, Youssef Mwue and Payel Das from IBM and uh, uh, Chris and uh, Steven Johnson um, from uh, MIT. Um, and so uh, what, is, what is a surrogate model? Uh, it is a learned model that fits a particular outcome of a partial differential equation, uh, which I will call PDE. Uh, and it, it is not a solver. Uh, that will compute the solution for the PDE, uh, but rather a data-driven model, which will fit a particular property of the PDE solution. For example, in uh, optics, uh, um, uh, where the PDE, uh, PDE is our Maxwell's equation, um, you can see on this image, um, a surrogate um, that is fitted to pre predict the complex transmission um, uh, through a structure uh, based on the parameters of the geometry here, the, the width of all those little rectangles over the 10 layers that you can see. And another parameter of the surrogate model uh, are the, is the frequency of the incoming light. Um, and today I uh, will show uh, results for this uh, specific surrogate model. Um, at evaluation time, um, since a surrogate model does not solve uh, for the PDE solution, but rather evaluates a fit, uh, surrogate models are orders of magnitude faster than PDE solvers. For an application like uh, this one in optics, a typical speed up would be 10,000 times faster in 2D uh, simulations uh, and uh, a million times faster for a 3D simulation. Um, uh, sorry. Um, and, and in practice, in optics, this surrogate model is used in conjunction with uh, decomposition methods um, for a very computationally challenging simulation problem, such as computing the light scattered by a metal surface. And if you are more interested, I'm not going to talk about it today, but if you're interested in, uh, into this, uh, please refer to my previous work in Optics Express. Um, uh, but, but there's no uh, free lunch. The fast evaluation uh, time uh, comes at the cost of generating a lot of training data, which uh, involves um, computing PDE solutions many times. And so data generation uh, re is really the bottleneck of uh, high dimensional surrogate models. Um, note that like surrogate models are also become more costly as the number of inputs uh, dimensions increases. But the bottleneck is the cost of the generation of the data. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk today. Um, and and uh, a, a first a surrogate model, a traditional one that works very well for up to four or five parameters uh, is Chebyshev interpolation. Chebyshev polynomials are great because they are exponentially convergent uh, for a smooth function. And so it, less, it requires less expensive PDE solves to train. Um, and, and these two images here, the top left and the bottom right, um, shows that like the choice of point is important. The strength of Chebyshev interpolation comes from its uh, polynomials and its uh, special set of training points that you can see at the bottom left, uh, the Chebyshev points. Uh, for the same function, uh, the top left image uses Chebyshev points and the bottom right uses equally spaced points. And the latter presents uh, very big artificial uh, oscillations, which are a catastrophe for uh, surrogate models, which is called Uranga phenomenon. And uh, here it really shows that, uh, yeah, the choice of points uh, really matters. Unfortunately, uh, for um, Chebyshev polynomials, uh, it requires, uh, for like a polynomial of degree n in each direction, it requires n plus 1. Uh, points. And so for p parameters, you would need uh, n plus 1 to the power of p points uh, to train uh, your surrogate model. And so the, the number of points um, uh, really quickly becomes intractable as the number of parameter increases. 
Uh, and this is called the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and so in contrast to polynomials, uh, neural networks seem to alleviate the curse of dimensionality. Uh, neural networks are now very popular. It is an algorithm with thousands to millions of parameters, which take uh, an input, uh, does a bunch of matrix multiplications composed with nonlinear activation functions on multiple layers. Research is still active to understand why they work so well, but they have had a lot of practical successes, in particular as surrogate models in optics. But again, there's a trade-off between accuracy and training time. A neural network uh, with many parameters might be more expressive, but it will be more expensive to evaluate and take more data to train. Again, today we are going to focus on alleviating the training cost, which is dominated by data generation. When and why should we use neural networks instead of brute force solvers for PDEs? Um, in optics, at least, a lot of people are trying to use neural network, um, but our physics model is great in optics, unlike uh, for some other problems where neural network are used, like uh, face recognition. Um, and, and so in the top left of this slide, uh, I show uh, uh, another Frenchman, a Frenchman like me, André-Marie Ampère, and in the top right, James Clerk Maxwell, and uh, them and a lot of other people worked really hard to have a very good physical model for electromagnetic waves. And, and neural networks, uh, the vanilla neural networks at least, don't, don't have physics in them. And so it's very difficult to compete with physical models and um, brute force solvers. And often um, you are better off solving for Maxwell's equation with a good brute force model uh, uh, directly. However, um, Surrogate models are a complete case for using neural networks because they can be reused millions of time and evaluate much faster than solving for the PDE. And so over time, you can amortize the training cost. And also they seem to handle uh, uh, high dimensional inputs well, so it makes them great candidates for surrogate applications. Later in this talk, I'm presenting ways to include the physical knowledge uh, of the PDEs inside the deep surrogate. So today I will focus on the topic of data efficiency and I will start by mentioning briefly an active learning algorithm which I published a couple years ago and I'm currently expanding uh, Coded in Julia with Ranjan and Antaraman. Um, and the question uh, for this type of uh, project is how can we use feedback from the surrogate model as it learns to find an efficient set of training points? Uh, start with the results here. Here I showed a fractional error on a test set for three models. Uh, in green, uh, the Chebyshev interpolation, which uses Chebyshev points, and it performs the worst because it suffers the curse of dimensionality. Recall I'm using this surrogate model I introduced earlier with 10 geometry parameters. Uh, the orange and blue models are neural network surrogates, which can we can already see that the neural networks perform much better than polynomials. And the orange one was trained with randomly sample points, where, uh, uh, whereas the blue one was trained with points explored using our active learning algorithm. We see that um, the blue model reaches an accuracy of 7% with about 20, uh, uh, 12 times less points than the orange model, showing the effectiveness of our active learning algorithm. And the active learning algorithm goes as followed. Um, the training set is initialized with a few sample, uh, a few points sampled at random. And then there are three steps. A, a training step first, where uh, you train your data model on your current training set. And you train another model, which is your uncertainty quantification model, which will give you an estimate of how well, uh, 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 or it's give you an estimate of the error uh, of your data model for your surrogate model. And then you have a second step, the filtering step, where you evaluate your uh, uncertainty model, your uh, error estimate on n times k randomly sample points. And you select only the k points with the highest uh, uncertainty estimates. And there's a third sp uh, uh, step where you compute the points, but only for those with highest uh, estimated uncertainty. Uh, and then you add those to the training set. And uh, you repeat this uh, t times. 
uh, and the result showed, showed in the previous slide, uh, M was equal to four. So I discarded three quarter of the randomly samples points before the PDA uh, 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 simulations and T was equal to eight. So for each data set size, the data set was created by incrementally adding points to the training set eight times. And what is great about this uh, uh, algorithm is its generality. It's independent of the uncertainty quantification method. So you can use it with var a variety of UQ techniques. And in fact, you only need a monotonic function of the error. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, confidence internal, uh, interval spread uh, would work just as well. And it's independent of the PDE. So, so it can work with any PDEs. And, uh, we've seen uh, already uh, 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 improvement and reduction in uh, need for data for Maxwell's equation, linear elastic mechanics, and uh, the Fourier heat equation. Um, and uh, in, in the NPG article from two years ago, I used uh, an ensemble of heteroscedastic regressions, uh, whose mean is the predictor. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, for the complex transmission and the pool variance is the measure of uncertainty quantification. Uh, and, uh, here the, uh, and, and here the loss uh, function was the negative log likelihood of the model. Um, I'm using uh, this loss function uh, in the next part uh, of my talk. Uh, and, and in this application, the model served both as predictor and as measure of uncertainty quantification, but technically, those two models don't need to be in the same, they can be separate. Uh, now I will focus on the second question. Uh, how uh, can we leverage field knowledge inside the surrogate? And this work was published at the end of last year on archive. Um, and indeed there is a lot of field knowledge out there to, to leverage on for surrogate models. Uh, we know a lot of PDEs that uh, governs different physical processes in optics, um, thermal, uh, quantum physics, photovoltaics, climate well, modeling or mechanics. And so uh, coming back on our optics example, we want to fit. So I'm uh, looking at uh, the, this uh, 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 box, the, 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 the rank top left rectangle, we want to fit the complex transmission computed by an accurate solver that is symbolized by a picture of James Clerk Maxwell. And the idea of the physics enhanced deep surrogate, the, the other box uh, called PEDS, uh, is to combine a neural network generator with a low fidelity model here symbolized by a cartoon of James Clerk Maxwell. In itself, the low fidelity model is very inaccurate with an error of more than 100%, uh, but it contains uh, knowledge of the physics. It contains Maxwell's equation, could contain, you know, in other applications, conservation laws. And, and it computes much faster than the high fidelity solver. The surrogate model takes the same geometry as the accurate solver. And inside PEDS, there are two channels. One is a field knowledge based transformation of the input to an input of the low fidelity solver. And the other goes through a generative neural network that will alter this low fidelity solver input. Trained end to end, the neural network generator finds the input to the low fidelity model that will result in the same complex transmission as the computationally costly accurate solver for Maxwell's equation. This type of surrogate model is about 10,000 times faster than solving for the custom Maxwell's equation directly in 3D. And here I'm presenting the fractional error with respect to the number of training data for these optic surrogate. Uh, and I compare the, the results of PETS combined with my active learning algorithm, which I presented before. Um, and I compare it to this, uh, the neural network only baseline and also to an improved baseline that uses active learning. And, and the, the improvement is really dramatic and potentially asymptotically faster. Looping back on the motivation for PEDS, uh, it can be applied to many different physics problems. 
Uh, a, a low fidelity model is very easy to find. It can be, for example, a model that is reducing the resolution. Um, it can be a model that is simplifying the physics, for example, I don't know, uh, um, removing a nonlinear term in the PDE. Uh, and, and you can apply this PET strategy for many physics problems. We're currently looking into uh, 3D Maxwell surrogates and surrogates for the Boltzmann transport equation. Wanted to um, talk about um, uh, th these projects are uh, now uh, both uh, fully implemented in Julia. Uh, the active learning project uh, uh, we're currently extended extending this active learning algorithm with Ranjan uh, and integrating it into Julia Sim Circuit or JL. And for the physics enhanced deep circuit, I'm going to release the code soon. Uh, it's currently um, uh, uh, not really uh, open source ready, um, but uh, it, it was easily uh, it was easy to stack the neural network with this like solver layer using uh, flux.gl and zygote.gl, and for the back, back propagation through the solver layer uh, under the hood, what it's doing is an adjoint simulation that is uh, solved inside an R rule. Uh, that, that was like custom defined using chain rules that GL. Uh, and the code runs on CPU, unfortunately, because um, uh, it, it uses uh, sparse solves, which are not supported on GPUs. Uh, and solving for the low fidelity solver in my case required a sparse solve. Um, but I, I did parallelize the batch loop uh, when training uh, the model uh, using MPI.GL and the all reduce function, which also needed um, uh, another R specific R, R rule. I'm very excited uh, to be presenting uh, here and invited to uh, give this talk. And I am open to collaboration. So please uh, contact me if you want to use this framework for your own physical systems. And uh, I will also uh, yeah. answer questions on yeah. Discord. Four minutes uh, <laughs> uh, for for your talk, but but uh, but yeah, we can. Um, let me quickly check the 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 Discord. Um. Yeah. Um. Actually, um, maybe I should perhaps lead with my own question. Um. Mm -hmm. So does. So you spoke about you know that you're looking at a coarse geometry and then you're you're using a generative network to uh, to generate the fine geometry and how do you train that generative network? Do you use like a multigrid method to figure out like an interpolation interpolating factor between some coarse geometry and a fine geometry and just keep training that into keep training that GAN to to imitate that interpolation or how exactly do you train it? Yeah, so the you know you have a lot of freedom uh, uh, in, in your generator. Uh, in the slides I've showed, it's actually um, uh, using a, the parameterization of the fine geometry. So it's it, you know it's using those width of the different rectangles, uh, and then it's just a, a fully connected neural network that that uh, uh, outputs like the a, a coarsified uh, version of, uh, of the structure uh, that will you know result uh, in in the same um, uh, complex transmission uh, once you solve it with this low fidelity solver and so matching the high fidelity solver. Uh, but I'm also exploring uh, uh, an, in another project like uh, uh, more of a convol convolutional arch architecture when the input is just like the fine image directly. Um, and and right now it's it, there's no there's it, it's not like uh, adversarial uh you know uh type of approach it, it's just uh you you have this you have this generator um uh that's that uh, which output is used by your low fidelity solver and, and then you're just tra training end to end to match uh uh the surrogate output that you need uh, that makes sense thanks um there's a question from youtube um you mentioned earlier in the in the talk about drawing candidate points at random. Yeah, so it was like uniformly uh, at random. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So that that's like uh, that's the baseline we used. Yeah. Okay. The the question is is what distribution that is, and you and you just uh, answered us. Yeah, yeah. And and then basically the, this active learning uh, uh, algorithm is is really kind of a Bayesian algorithm where uh, you know you you're 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 basically changing the the the, the distribution of of uh, of your sample points by using this filtering technique. Um, you also have a couple of questions from Discord. So, um, does PEDS introduce a new level of opaqueness in the investigation of uh, the Maxwell equations? Uh, what does it mean by by opaqueness? Uh, it, it, I would say, if anything, it's it's adding knowledge and it's making it more interpretable. Uh, you can, for example, um, uh, inspect what uh, what is the generated uh, low fidelity structure. And uh, maybe make sense out of it. Um, uh, so, so in a sense of interpretability of your model, I think it's uh, and and you and then the low fidelity solver is really just like a solver for the PDE, so it's pretty interpretable. Okay, um, but I'm, I might have misunderstood the question. Yeah, no, I um, yeah, I guess that's that's one interpretation. Um, there's there's another one on Discord and on YouTube. So why do you need a, a a sparse solve instead of a low resolution dense solve? You know specifically when when talking about the FDDT simulation. Yeah, so it's an uh, 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 a frequency domain simulation. So you have you know uh, your your you you have your operator that is uh, you know matrix which is uh, uh, you know uh, very sparse. So you want to use this uh, property in order to uh, you know solve it efficiently and be able to scale it a bit. Okay, and um, I think the the person who asked the question about opaqueness, uh, they by opaqueness they meant that uh, you know there is there's an extra layer added, right? I mean, there's this generator layer added that that perhaps uh, is not interpretable, or perhaps is not uh, we that that we don't quite may not know how to interpret as well. Uh, so, if you have any comments on that? Yeah, in in the archive paper, we actually have a whole section about. Um... Uh, 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 you know, physical insights uh, related to the the generator. Um, so you, you can see what it generates, and then you, uh, we did also some uh, PCA analysis of of the generator, and we could like uh, and 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 this all like the the results we found like all made sense. For example, uh, for um, higher uh, frequency, um, which corresponds to shorter wavelengths. The generated structures like were varying va varying much more uh, compared to like low frequency uh, uh, type of gener uh, 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 generations. Okay, so I think um, I've exhausted the questions from YouTube and Slack, but I had one. I had one more on uh, on on geometries again. Aren't there other aren't there other types of methods out there that generate uh, geometries for you know for for PDE solutions? Um, and you know, if so, if, is is do you get a chance to look at in, any of the other methods? Um, so the the method I've um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but um, there is a, a whole literature on a technique called space mapping, um, and uh, the major difference is in space mapping the 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 dimension of the uh, the dimension of your low fidelity solver is the same as the dimension of your high fidelity solver. So you don't, you don't have that um, uh, that freedom uh, in the generate in the generator. You don't have as much freedom. Uh, so, but that's that's a very large literature over the past twenty years. Um, yeah. All right, that 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 makes sense. There's there's one more question on YouTube about benchmarks. Um, when you said your approach is faster than PD solvers, you know how how much faster? Um, when I approach what? Um, so supposing um, you know, let's say you are solving the Maxwell's equations, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, versus yeah. So 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 in order to get this complex transmission, so like it's a surrogate model, it's not a solver, right? So you you only care about the complex transmission, for example, or for some other applications. Uh, in in thermal, uh, you might uh, care about the thermal conductivity of your your structure. Uh, or like the young model is in linear elas uh, elastic mechanics. Uh, so there's just one number. Um, and so um, to, to compute that number, 
uh, it's uh, for example, uh, go back in optics. Uh, it was it's uh, ten thousand times faster to evaluate that pads uh, compared to evaluating the brute force Maxwell solve. All right, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, 